Eat human. Les humains à leur meilleur. <rire> C'est toi pour Hell. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you're putting your health first during this time. In case anyone is wondering, I'm working on the Food Lives film daily, and we're still trying to get it out in the fall, right when everything is hopefully back to normal. You can still pre-order a copy on Indiegogo and also get great extras like the special features or the Eat Meat shirt. We just sent out the new batch of shirts last week and have about 20 left if people want to jump on those. That's on Indiegogo.com. And search for Food Lies Post for post-production or click through foodlies.org. Today, Dr. Mike Eads joins me for a really great and comprehensive interview. I've been following his work for many years and always enjoy his presentations that can be found on YouTube. We got to hang out all weekend in Denver a little ways back, and I got to see another of his amazing presentations live, talking about what humans evolved to eat and what happened as we strayed away from that diet. It's shocking stuff and sure to ruffle the feathers of every single mainstream doctor, dietitian, and nutritionist around. We go over this and much of his other work in this interesting episode. Dr. Michael Eads is a physician and the author of 10 books in the fields of health, nutrition, and exercise over the last several decades. Among them, the New York Times bestseller, Protein Power, and the Protein Power Life Plan, which laid out one of the first nutritional concepts of the paleo lifestyle. Since 1986, Dr. Eads has been in full-time practice of bariatric, nutritional, and metabolic medicine. Become a producer of the show on Patreon by searching for Peak Human there or going to patreon.com slash peakhuman. This show is made possible entirely by listeners like you. I really appreciate this model and us making it happen as a team with only a few bucks here and there. Find out about everything else at sapien.org and join the newsletter there to stay in tune with the new announcements and other special features we're offering to the Sapien tribe. Everyone knows about the great meat we deliver at nosetail.org by now. We're selling out each week, so jump on it Friday midday to Sunday night to make sure we can get it out Monday or Tuesday morning. Here's Dr. Mike Eads. All right, we're live. Dr. Mike Eads, thanks so much for joining me today. Glad to be here. It's been a long time in the making. I read Protein Power a long time ago, and you've written a bunch of other books since, and I've seen a bunch of your presentations and had a good time hanging out in low-carb Denver. (laughs) Yeah, it was so, fun, yeah. even though we were socially distancing. Yeah, worked out. I don't know. Did anyone get sick? Did you I feel don't okay? Think so. I felt fine. I flew there and flew back and was in and out of airports, and I didn't have a problem. And I don't know. I haven't heard of anyone getting sick. Yeah, I got tested just for fun because my business partner is a doctor, and we did the test, and I didn't get it. I was like, I thought I could be exposed. I was in that Denver airport. I was all over mm-hmm. the place. But Yeah, me too. Did you get the antibody test or the... Yeah, just, the antibody. Oh, you got the antibody test. Okay, good. Yeah. You're still vulnerable. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I mean, I was hoping I just had it and had no symptoms because I yeah. felt perfect ever, you know, this whole time. So there's so much to cover. If anyone isn't aware of you, I guess the easiest thing to do is just go on YouTube and search some of your presentations. Those are always good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're all there. Yeah. I love the low carb Denver one you did this year that isn't online yet, but I was hoping to run through it because it's really appropriate to, you know, my, all the stuff I'm doing and especially with the food lies film, we're looking into what are humans meant to eat? You know, I know we know what nutritionists in the eighties and nineties think we should eat, but uh, what should humans eat is a much better question when you look back and you get a lot better answers. So let's start from the beginning. Where did you start? We, you started with talking about Game Changers, actually, which I love because I made a film debunking it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I started with that just because, uh, you know, these are the same people. I think in the presentation, I said uh, it's the same team, different jerseys. The, uh, you know, the plant based people, which are basically the low fat, high carb diet people trying to make a case for plant based foods and make them seem, you know, absolutely wonderful. And when the reality is that they're far from that, even though that sounds heretical to say. Well, yeah, I'm glad you're saying this. I mean, you've been saying it for years, really. But just you also showed some slides of foods back in the day, like menus that were just Mm -hmm. pure meat. 
Yeah, well, that was one of the things. I was talking about a couple of articles in the Wall Street Journal authored by these same people. They talked about uh, how in the, in the 19th century, back in the, the 1800s, that meat wasn't available and everybody ate uh, plants, basically. And I pointed out, I pulled up, I just went on to Google, anybody can do this, pull up menus, 1800s, and look at the scads of menus out there and mainly what they had. And these were for restaurants, for ships, because back then that was how you traveled intercontinentally. And if you look at any of these menus, they're mainly meat. And there was plenty of meat. And I showed pictures of meat markets in London and meat markets in the United States. And they were loaded with meat. You know, back then, you didn't have refrigeration and uh, like we do today. So it, it's hard to keep plant foods fresh for very long. I mean, there are certain ones, root vegetables in particular. And if you notice, those are basically the plant foods that are on all those old menus. But, uh, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables don't last very long. Uh, unless there's some way to transport them in a refrigerated truck. And we didn't have that ability back then. So people didn't have, other than in the summer, this wide variation of fruits and vegetables that you see when you go into grocery stores. And when you go back beyond that, they didn't have any at all. If you go back to Paleolithic times in Europe, basically what you had to eat year round was meat. And that's essentially what we cut our teeth on evolutionarily. And I think in the presentation, a slide that showed the progression of humans from our first, you know, real common kind of a hominid ancestor, which was Australopithecus uh, afarensis, and then showed on the progression through the various proto-human lines until we got to humans. And all along the way, we ate more and more and more meat. And the one line that broke off from that and went in a vegetarian way uh, ended up uh, basically dying out. So, I mean, we tried <laughs> vegetarianism in our ancient past and it didn't really work. Yeah, I love that slide. It's the dead end. And I love that the concept of the our chimp ancestors have been eating the high fruit and vegetable diet forever. And look where they're at. They didn't get the big brains. Right, right. You know, I also pointed out in there that a big difference between us and chimps is that chimps don't uh, really forage. And by forage, I mean that they don't eat kills from other animals. They just uh, seem to have no interest in that, whereas that's basically how we got started into meat eating, that we would take over kills of other animals. And I slowed, showed slides that showed how this researcher in Africa looked at lion kills and how much actual food was left over after a lion kills, and it's a huge amount. And so there was plenty for people to survive on after the lions left. And the uh, and that's, you know, that's called sort of passage, passive foraging. And there's also active foraging, which is obviously more dangerous if you've got to go in and run lions up. There's a great YouTube video that I've seen a half a dozen times where these, you know, I think three African guys run a bunch of lions off a kill. And, you know, and the lions could have torn them to pieces, but they were able to intimidate the lions and run them off this kill and then, you know, hacked off big chunks of whatever it was at Wildebeest, I think, and carted it back to uh, their village. Mm. And so, you know, that was active foraging versus passive foraging. But I think that it's not just that I think this, I think the anthropologists in general believe that that's how we started meat eating was by foraging because we were little and dinky and didn't really have tools then to kill from afar. And um, that's how we developed our taste for meat and, and which basically promoted our development from that point on. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, talked a lot about this in the film and even in my presentation and why our guts are so, our stomachs are so acidic is, you know, it's a similar to that of a hyena that also scavenges mm -hmm. meat, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have your slide too. And you, yeah, you have a zebra carcass, even that if it's Pick through has 6,000 calories and a wildebeest, a yep. couple thousand calories. Yep. And then yeah. you talked about the stable isotope stuff too. Yeah, that's a, a really a, a technical method to tell what people ate in ancient times because, you know, when you talk about a lot of this stuff, it's, it's really speculative and some people write it off as just so stories. With stable isotope analysis, scientists are able to uh, actually look at remains of ancient people and, and pretty much tell what they were eating, at least in terms of amounts. 
and nitrogen, the, uh, you know, you got two types of isotopes and isotopes are just, uh, the combination of, uh, neutrons and protons in a, an atom of something. Um, the number of neutrons differ and some of those isotopes are stable. They don't change over time and others are unstable and they decay. Carbon 14 is a, is one that decays and that's what's used for carbon dating because you can tell by the amount that's there now compared to what should have been there and you know the decay time so you can date something using that. But a stable isotope stays the same. So if you look at a stable nitrogen isotope, for example, you can tell how much meat, uh, basically how much protein an ancient human ate. And the stable isotope analysis, and there's some good videos on, uh, on YouTube that explain that, but the stable isotope analysis will tell you that pretty accurately. And because this nitrogen, um, it uh, it's like, you know, when a little fish like mercury accumulates, the, the stable isotope, the nitrogen accumulates. So if you have an herbivore, it will have a certain percentage of this stable isotope in it. Well, if another animal eats that, then it's going to accumulate and you're going to have a higher one in that animal. So as it goes up the sort of the trophic ladder, as it's called, you can tell the higher up there, the more meat this animal ate. And it turns out that, you know, you've got herbivores that have a certain amount and you've got carnivores above them. And then if you look at humans, they're even above the carnivores, which tells you that humans are basically super carnivores because not only did they eat the herbivores, they ate the carnivores as well. Mm -hmm. And by looking at some carbon stable isotopes, you can tell basically whether this meat came from terrestrial animals or whether it came from animals in, you know, in rivers and, and oceans. And it, it's interesting because early on, it basically came from terrestrial animals because they were big and they had a high fat content. And a lot of them were hunted to extinction. And then early man had to end up, you know, fishing, gathering mussels, you know, getting small animals going to the seashore and, and getting food that way. And it, it gives a whole different picture. So it, it really can present an accurate picture of what the ancient diet was, was all about without guesswork. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that you also have a, a similar approach. One of your early slides had all the different things we're looking at, stable isotope, nitrogen testing. We're looking at bones. We're looking at historical accounts. You know what I mean? We're anthropological studies, stable isotope, archaeological findings, soft tissue analogists, radio... Graphic studies, butcher mark, tooth enamel, paleopathological, dental calculus, blood residue, jaw morphology. There's so much to look at. It's mm -hmm. funny that a film like Game Changers, they'll cherry pick one quote from someone that says something about, you know, one little thing that, oh, well, you, we ate a lot of plants because we found one remains where they had a bit of plaque that had plant tissue in their teeth. Mm -hmm. Well, if the truth be known, I'm sure early man ate everything he'd get his hands on. And that's the issue. I mean, had there been uh, Cheetos, I'm sure he would have eaten those too. Mm -hmm. And tacos and whole wheat bread and anything else he could have gotten his hands on. But that wasn't available. And I tell people, you know, just take a sharpened stick and go out in the woods and see what you can find. And you can't find a whole lot. And early man learned how to hunt. And so he was able to, by hunting, meet his nutritional needs. And everybody says, well, you know, uh, look at carnivores. They've got these huge um, teeth. They've got, you know, they're strong. They can run fast. They've got great eyesight. You know, humans don't have any of that compared to that. They don't have big claws. They don't have, you know, these giant fangs. They don't have the huge muscles and the muscle density and the ability to run down predators. So how can we really have been not just predators, but super predators? And the reason is because we have a brain. That's basically our weapon mm -hmm. is we were able to develop the ability to kill from afar with spears. We were able to, by using spears, gang up on these big mammals and take them down. Our brain was our weapon. And because we ate meat, we were able to develop a larger brain because we ended up having to have a smaller gut, not having to have a smaller gut. We ended up being able to get by on a smaller gut in order to free up that energy to develop the brain. And I talked about in the, in that talk, the, you know, the Kleiber line. And so that's sort of the law of metabolic constraints that your metabolism is, is more or less set by an equation that involves your, basically your body size. And so wherever you fall along that line, 
that's where your metabolism is going to be. And if you uh, are going to develop a more metabolically active tissue, such as our brain, something else has got to give for you to stay on that line. And what gave in our case was the gut. And the gut was able to give because we ate uh, extremely nutrient-dense food in meat, and we learned to cook, and that allowed us to even eat some vegetable matter that added to the whole thing. And so we ate a much more nutritionally dense, easily digestible diet than these big herbivores. And so we were able to evolve a larger brain and our brain became our weapon. You know, we didn't involve fangs. We didn't involve claws. We didn't, you know, evolve huge muscle mass. We evolved a brain and that made up for all that. Yeah. And they call the expensive tissue hypothesis. And you can look at a great visual of this. It's so obvious. There's an old Iola and Wheeler study in 1995. I can include mm-hmm. in the show notes and that you included it, just showing the the weight in grams of the different organs. And you can see the gut and the brain, how they're different than observed than expected. Right. Exactly. You know, for something of that size. Because if you look at a sheep, let's say that weighs the same as a human, it's got a tiny brain and a huge gut. And humans are just the opposite. And the only way that you can have that small gut is to eat nutritionally dense food, such as meat, you know, some cooked tubers, basically is what early man survived on. Yeah. Sure, he ate fruits and and, uh, berries in season. But again, those things uh, were only available seasonally and they were hard to store. But, you know, meat, you could dry meat and smoke meat and that would last for a long time. Exactly. And you just look at the size of our guts too, just visually how big these you know, prother primates guts are and compared to ours. Mm-hmm. And then even the plant food, how much would it take to gather that many plant foods? <laughs> you know, it's funny, oh. multiple, you know, dozens of pounds. Yeah, a huge amount. People don't think about this. They think, oh, you should get all your food from non-meat sources. And the only way you can realistically do that is by eating processed food. I mean, if you eat a bunch of bagels, those are pretty nutrient dense, but yeah, energy dense. And so you can eat uh, bagels, you can eat breads, you can eat donuts. I mean, God, there are a ton of <laughs> calories in a donut. You can eat sugar, you can eat all those things and end up meeting your caloric requirements, but it doesn't do you a lot of good. And if you try to go out and eat what you would find in the wild, I mean, you'd have to eat, you know, kind of bushel of apples. Some of these foods, cucumbers, I mean, I I don't know, I don't have the chart in front of me, but pounds and pounds and pounds and pounds of things like that. It's like 8 to 20 pounds of stuff. You like to get 65% of your diet, as they're suggesting, Mm -hmm. it would be Mm -hmm. 26 pounds of celery or 24 pounds of tomato or 10 pounds of carrots. And it's, it's just funny. I mean, it's a huge amount and people don't think of that. And, you know, when they're on a vegetarian diet, they don't anywhere near that tonnage of food because what they do is eat really highly processed foods that are extremely calorically dense. Well, that's what happened in the game changers. You know, they have this like supposed strong guy who Mm. Patrick Baboumian and, you know, then you look on YouTube and he's drinking like 10 protein shakes a day of all the vegan garbage protein powders and stuff. Yeah. It's the only way to do it. Yeah. It's like, how is he going to do it? He's like, well, I'm, yeah, I'm doing all these process, modern, ridiculous things. Yeah. So. And one of the things, and I didn't really talk about it in the um, in the presentation, but one of the things that you always hear vegetarians talk about, they'll say, well, if you can't build muscle on a vegetarian diet, how did cows, the cattle that you're so fond of, become so muscular <laughs> on a vegetarian diet? Therefore, they become muscular on a vegetarian diet, so you can become muscular on a vegetarian diet. And number one, you know that's not true. If you've ever seen people on these real vegetarian diets, they're all kind of skinny and stringy. Mm -hmm. Um, The deal is with cows is that they don't really digest their own foods, that they are loaded with bacteria that digest their own foods. And the bacteria themselves have a lot of protein, and they can convert the protein from plants into their own protein and the cow essentially digest the bacteria and that's where the cows get their protein. So they get their protein from organisms that, you know, I wouldn't call them necessarily, you know, bacteria. Yeah. You know, they're not like mice or something, but they're certainly living. Uh, and so they provide the cow with the protein and we don't have that. We don't have those kind of bacteria in our guts and cows eat all the time and they have multiple stomachs to accommodate these bacteria. And that's how they end up making their muscle from basically plant food. It's really funny that that 
line in the movie, I think it was in there twice about two different animals, an ox and and a, a gorilla that even made it into a film. Like this is a film that took millions of dollars of, to make. And it's the stupidest mm-hmm. thing I've ever heard. It's funny that some editor didn't fact check her person or even lawyer. Be like this is an absurd line. Why is this in the film? <laughs> but uh, yeah. anyway, the study in North America with the Harding Village farmers mm-hmm. and the Indian Knoll hunters. Yeah. So the one group right. was farmers, one group was hunters. And there's, there's about 290 subjects in each group that they studied their remains. So, mm-hmm. yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, was an interesting study done by the Smithsonian Institute, oh, I don't know, several decades back. And those are both famous archaeological sites in Kentucky. And one of them, the Hunter Gatherer site, was from about 4,000 years ago. And the, uh, the farming site, the agricultural site, is from, I don't know, back uh, pre-contact with Europeans. So back in the 14, 1500s. Yeah, it was like 1500 and, uh, to 1675 yeah, AD. Yeah. Another one was 3000 yeah, BC. And, yeah. And so the, the hunter-gatherers in this study lived in one spot which is unusual for hunter-gatherers because they're usually nomadic and they're wandering around all over the place. And, and one of the things that anthropologists know is that hunter-gatherers were much healthier than agriculturalists. And when people turned to agriculture, their health, uh, their health went to hell in a handbasket. They became shorter in stature. They had more infections. They had more tooth decay. They had uh, shorter longevity. Uh, they had more infant mortality. And they had all kinds of signs of uh, iron deficiency and different other vitamin deficiencies, none of which hunter-gatherers had. The brains even and, shrunk a bit. Right. And people who want to make the case for the vegetarian diet say, well, the reason for that is because the hunter-gatherers were mobile. They were nomads. They were in small groups. They didn't get disease. And the reason that the agriculturalists had such crappy health is that they were crammed together in, in basically cities. And they, uh, you know, passed all these bugs among one another and they were sick and they had higher rates of infection because of that, and the infectious burden is what made them smaller and blah, 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 blah. The interesting thing about this study is that the hunter-gatherers were not nomadic. They were in a fixed spot, and they roamed from there to hunt, and they basically had you know a whole range of game animals that they had, and they had very little plant food, uh, and they all, you know, they left these mounds that you can go through and, and figure out, or the archaeologists, anthropologists can go through and figure out what they ate. And they ate basically a meat-based diet. The Indian Nolers, the hardened villagers, the uh, the farmers uh, ate squash, mainly squash and some pumpkins and basically plants like that. They didn't have wheat. I mean, these were basically, you know, pumpkin gourd squashes, things like that. And, you know, and the health difference between the two was incredible. I mean, the, the hunters and gatherers barely had any tooth decay. The farmers were riddled with it. The hunter-gatherers had uh, lower uh, amounts of these inflammation, bone inflammations that you can see. I mean, you don't know what the soft tissue inflammation is because was because that isn't available. All you have are the skeletal remains, but the skeletal remains have these bony infections that are probably yaws, which is, a, I hate to use the term syphilis, but it's a syphilis variant in that it's not necessarily a venereal disease, but it's caused by the same kind of a triple nemal bug that syphilis is caused by. And, um, you know, the farmers were taller. I mean, the hunters were taller. They were more robust and uh, less infant mortality. They had less uh, enamel hypoplasia, which is a sign of severe nutritional distress. They had less crypto orbitalia, which is uh, other signs of iron deficiency anemia. And, you know, the farmers had it all. I mean, they had all the bad things that you can get. The only thing that they didn't have as many of are what are called Harris lines, which are things that you can see when you x-ray long bones. And there are little lines that go across horizontally on the bones that that uh, more or less uh, describe episodes of mild nutritional distress. So apparently the hunter-gatherers had some mild nutritional distress here and there, but the enamel hypoplasia, which is a, a sort of a malformation of tooth enamel, uh, which indicates severe nutritional stress was vastly more common in the uh, farmers than in the hunters. So the hunters did have some mild nutritional stress, but the hunters had major, nutri- I mean, the farmers had major nutritional distress. 
And so all in all, the, you know, the hunters were vastly more healthy than were the farmers. Yeah, this one's so interesting because there's very equivalent groups. They have similar genetics and they were, Mm -hmm. you know, they're both pretty non-nomadic, as you're saying. They're sedentary. They both stay the same. So it's like a 99 to 1. It was like 99 good things for the hunter-gatherers and one bad thing. But then really that one bad thing, you know, these Harris lines, I mean, that kind of just means this is kind of what we knew is that if you're hunter-gatherers, you don't always – get the kill you yeah. don't and that's fine and that's right we ran on fat and we we could we were fasting and you know maybe more extreme case it wasn't great but this is how humans were designed right exactly yeah and these were two groups of people separated by time and diet and the diet made a huge difference but and it's also interesting because people think that all this progress is always good or it's like these people were four thousand five thousand years before Yet they're way healthier. Mm, way healthier, yeah. It's just funny. The, I first got onto this reading your book, Protein Power, because you talked about the Egyptians. And it's the same story mm. there. Yeah. You know, the Egyptians are interesting because unlike most archaeological subjects, the, there is soft tissue in the Egyptians because they mummified people. So whereas these Indian tribes we've been talking about, um, these you know, populations of uh, Native Americans, I guess you'd call them, all, all that was left were skeletal remains. With the Egyptian population, you've got soft tissue remains, so you can see things like parasites and uh, obesity. Um, you can do blood typing on them. I mean, it, it's amazing what you do. You can find soft tissue cancers, of which there were very few. You know, you can find all kinds of things when you have the soft tissue to go by. Atherosclerosis? And, you know, Yep, atherosclerosis. I mean, they do autopsies on mummies. Basically, they scan them now, but in the early days, they did autopsies on them. The whole subject is fascinating because Egyptians ate a wheat-based diet. I mean, their entire diet was based on wheat, and it ran through the whole gamut of, you know, from lower-class Egyptians to, you know, the pharaohs. They all had basically the same diet, and they had... uh, you know, and they supplemented it with a little honey. They got an occasional wildfowl. They ate some fish, almost never red meat. All their, you know, their their animals were used for work, uh, used for power. And so basically they had a diet that a modern nutritionist would consider almost nirvana. You know, of course, whole ground, of course, you know, stone ground, whole wheat bread, honey, a little bit of fish, a little bit of white meat from birds and uh, or from, you know, waterfowl up and down the Nile, and yet their health was abysmal. They were just eaten up with tooth decay. They had horrible tooth abscesses. They had um, atherosclerosis when they did autopsies on them, and they discovered they had bad vascular disease, even at early ages. And so, I mean, their health was awful. And they had, you know, they were obese because you can tell by the size of the mummies. Some of them had, you know, huge fat folds. They had what appears to be diabetes. They had signs of high blood pressure that you can see from the thickening of the of their arteries. You know, eating the same diet that a lot of nutritionists would recommend to us today to avoid high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, tooth decay, on and on and on. The Egyptians had that diet and they were eaten up with all those things. And it's really interesting because sugar hadn't come on the scene then. So you can't blame sugar yeah. for these problems. Because a lot of people, they say, well, yeah, but, the, you know, people eat a lot of sugar, so they get tooth decay and they get this and they get that. But it's it's not just the sugar. It's wheat and bread and, you know, an agricultural-based diet, of, especially of grains, that um, at least drove that problem with the Egyptians. There was a group that lived in Morocco about 15,000 years ago, so they certainly didn't have sugar, and they were way before the Egyptians, and they ate basically acorns and they made a paste out of them and they made little patties out of them and they made uh, you know all their food was based on that and those are kind of sticky and they had just horrific dental disease yeah and we should point out just to make sure people understand that tooth health is like a really good indicator of your overall health exactly you know teeth are really hard they're difficult to damage and when you see People, I mean, and, and we evolved to have teeth that uh, could handle the diet that we were supposed to eat, basically. And when you see people with terrible dental problems, uh, you realize that, 
you know, they probably weren't eating the diet they were evolved to eat. Yeah. That's Weston Price stuff. Again, bring it up every mm -hmm. podcast almost, but nutrition and physical degeneration. Mm -hmm. This is so important. I don't know why more people aren't talking about this Egyptian stuff. I, and I want to know how they explain it away because it is the ideal diet. It's non-GMO. It's not super refined. You know what I mean? They're like, this is, they're grinding flour in the coarse ground, like super healthy, ancient grains. You know, everyone's like, oh, it's the ancient grains. It's the einkorn wheat. Yeah, Amor, Amor Amor wheat, wheat yeah. and einkorn wheat. Yep. This is the most ideal diet that any Harvard nutrition professor could ever imagine. All organic, free range, lean meats, with all the whole grains and they were a mess. Mm -hmm. They were a mess. So how do people explain this away? Like, what is your take on this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they point to other societies that eat a lot of carbs that seem to have no problems. Mm. And uh, like the- The Ketovans uh, the or something or the Simone. Or... Yeah, that's one they bring up all the time that they eat all these sweet potatoes and they do fine. And uh, it's some recently discovered tribe in South America, it's the same thing, they eat a, uh, some kind of tuber and, and, you know, they have great health and good teeth and no heart disease and low blood pressure. And, and what I always say to that is that, um, one of my favorite philosophers, economists is a guy named Frederick Bastiat, who was a 19th century French economist and philosopher. And he wrote this, uh, this terrific essay called that, which is seen and that, which is not seen. And it sounds obvious, but we see that, which is seen. And we don't see that which is not seen, and that which is not seen is often much more important than that which is seen. So you take a, a group like the Catavans, who seem to have pretty good health on a high-carb diet, that which is seen. That which is not seen is what their health would be if they ate a meat-based mm. diet. They may be vastly more healthy. We just don't know. Oh, also, I think there's a huge difference between a whole food you know, tuber and a grain, Right. Like these ground grains, oh. which we can get into later, even, you know, we're talking about the incretins and, and the GIP mm -hmm. and the GLP one, like how these ground grain products interact with your body is much different than eating a potato. Oh, yeah. So it does. But still, it's that which is not seen. We don't know how they would do. The Catamas might be vastly better if they had a grown an all meat diet. We just don't know. I love that point. And also they're getting animal foods when they can. You know, I've looked, right, right, they're eating yeah. fish and little yeah, animals I mean, and, and, you know, whatever they can get. Right, right. I don't really think that there's any ancestral group mm -hmm. <laughs> that wouldn't eat meat if it were available to Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Well, they did those studies. It's the ethnographic atlas and other right. groups, not one of the 200 something were plant based. Right. Over half of them were actually like 75% animal based. It was like very heavy on yeah, animal based. Right. Diet. Yeah, that was uh, my friend Lauren Cordain kind of straightened that out because there was a, back in the sixties, there was this uh, big conference in Chicago called man, the hunter. In fact, I've got the, uh, the book on that, the, all the, the talks and it's really difficult to get now, but anyway, and this man, the hunter, they, someone had gone through the ethnographic Atlas and pointed out that 30, the ancient man on average got 35% of calories from animal sources and 65 percent from plant sources and when lauren cordain went back through the same ethnographic atlas he realized that when they had done that first study the, the 35 percent animal study that they had uh, not included small game they looked at only large game they not included small game uh you know mussels shellfish fish turtles uh reptiles yeah they only grubs bugs all the ways that people would get uh, basically animal foods, protein foods. They had s simply looked at large game. And when you add all this other in, then the average comes out to be just reverse. It's 65% animal food and 35% plant food. And then a lot of groups would be above that. You know, they were 70, 75%, 80%, 85%, up into the 90% animal foods. And very few were at the other end of the spectrum. Very few. We're definitely presenting this in the Food Lies film. We're kind of talking about some of Mickey Bendor's stuff, and he wrote a paper called Man, the Fat Hunter. So he added in mm -hmm. fat there, which was, you know, our energy source. We wanted the energy, and all we wanted was fat and protein. Yeah, I mean, that's why all those huge animals were hunted to extinction. I mean, a, an amazing experience, if you ever get the chance to do it, is to go to the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And, I mean, I can get lost in there. I love that place mm -hmm. so much. There's a whole floor of ancient 
giant animals that used to roam the United States. I mean, these huge things that you had no idea even existed here. And they were all hunted to extinction by early man. It took early man from the time he came across the Bering Strait to decimate all the large game in North America and South America. It took about a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And when you see the, the size of these things that were decimated, it's just unbelievable. Yeah, this megafauna. It's and they, yeah, they could feed us for so long, and we had all these methods of preserving them, and or even we could just mm -hmm. eat them. Our stomachs are were, could mm -hmm. handle the kind of decaying yeah. flesh. Right. I mean, and, and people who made it across the Bering Strait. I mean, there are all kinds of theories. I mean, I think that that's the theory that most people believe in, and I have no idea because I've never really made it my life's work to try to figure that out. But uh, that seems to be the, the viewpoint of most serious anthropologists, archaeologists, is that people came across the Bering Strait. And, I mean, look at where the Bering Strait is. I mean, it's cold up there. And the reason that they were able to walk across is because the water was frozen. There weren't any plant foods up there. <laughs> Yeah, for years at a time or for entire lifetimes, even if maybe. And so those were meat eaters that came across there. Yeah. I never understand how people, I think they just try to make these two arguments. They say they'll accept that we were meat eaters, but they'll either say, oh, well, that was a long time ago and we died at 35, which is one argument, which we can debunk <laughs> easily because that's the average age of death, which includes all the infant mortality and all the accidents and infectious disease and all the other things that brings down the average. So they'll either say that, but then once you debunk that, then maybe they'll say, oh, but the meat we have now is bad. You know, oh, there's this like CAFO meat, you know, poison meat. I was like, well, I'm like, no, not really. <laughs> I mean, obviously I want to get grass fed meat and, you know, support regenerative agriculture, but it's not like the meat we have is any different really than what we had before. No, no, it's not. And actually, I think it's pretty interesting. I've not really heard anybody other than myself make this argument. But if you look back at uh, paleo man, basically early man, and there's some real eyewitness accounts of this, of, of European people, you know, running into groups who had not been in contact with the Western world and watch how they ate things. And they ate everything but the hair. That's about the only thing mm -hmm. they didn't eat. And they ate the viscera. They ate everything. You know, they would boil the bones to extract stuff out. Even the Inuits go through this deal of boiling the bones and, and it's a whole process to extract fat out of the bones. And they, um, I mean, they would eat it from snout to tail, as they say, and truly everything but the hair. And so they got, you know, because a lot of the visceral fat had a higher fat content and they ate that. And you hear these stories like from Wilhelmer Stefansson, how the Eskimos, you know, threw the lean meat to the dogs because they wanted the, the fatty cuts of meat. And today we don't really eat a lot of viscera. Today's modern agricultural techniques have developed animals with a lot of fat around their meat, i.e. cows. And it used to be that way with pigs. And now they've gotten into this whole notion of you want to have lean meat and you don't want to, you know, you don't want to have fatty meat. So pigs are being bred to be lean now. And as a consequence, you know, trying to get a good pork chop is hard to do because they're so lean. And uh, but beef, you can still get a pretty good amount of fat on there. And so I think that now because our tastes have changed, that agricultural practices have evolved to provide us the fat we need actually on the muscle meats. Uh, instead of the viscera, because we don't really eat the viscera anymore. Mm. So that's interesting. So we shifted it. That is a huge problem, I think, is that we're everything we're doing was for so long was with the goal of making things leaner when it's the opposite of what we should have been doing. Right, exactly. I'm all on board with this nose to tail thing. I mean, that's my company, actually. But uh, I don't want to plug my own company, even though I already did. So yeah, this is, is so great. So there's all the, I'm still looking through some of these slides with all the atherosclerosis, like there's carotid, you could see the carotid artery had occlusions and dam and uh, all these different MRI scans that you can do now to show how messed up the right. Egyptians were. It shows the calcium in there, the calcium deposition and the atherosclerosis. Yeah. I mean, they had it bad. They had it bad. And so then like fast forward, so... There's also the big difference between surviving and thriving, right? We know that you can survive, mm -hmm. humans can survive on certain things, but can we thrive? 
And now we can fast forward to all the people who are going back to these type of ancestral diets and thriving. Uh, mm -hmm. You did another presentation on a new hypothesis of obesity. So we can get into that kind of quickly, but just what's going on there? It's like, we know how people can thrive. We know some people can survive on vegetarian diets. What happens when most of the people in America are overweight? People have all kinds of different ideas of why we got fat and sick and all this chronic disease, you know? Mm. So, and so I want to just know mm. what is your idea? Like, what do you think is the, the most important factor? Uh, well, if you look at kind of the history of obesity, there have always been a certain percentage of the population who have been obese. All this is taken the United States and, and Europe. And if you go back and you look from the time these statistics have been kept, by various governmental agencies, which started in the early 1900s, I think about 1910, they started looking at that. And obesity in the United States didn't really change much. I mean, there was sort of a, a gradual increase in obesity over the years, but not anything that was substantial. Now, that doesn't mean that during this time there weren't hugely obese people because there were, but there was just a small percentage of the population. And as you know, my friend Gary Taubes points out in all of his books, all the European doctors at the time thought that those people were carb sensitive. And by putting them on low carb diets, you could solve their problems. But that percentage stayed relatively the same uh, moving forward. And then we hit the late 1970s. And in the late 1970s, you know, you had the McGovern Committee, uh, who was run by George McGovern, who was a senator from South Dakota, which is a big wheat growing state. And he was also a devotee of Nathan Pritikin, the, you know, the mm -hmm. vegan guy who died at an early age from leukemia uh, with allegedly clean arteries. And McGovern kind of strong armed this whole, these nutritional guidelines through. And these nutritional guidelines were based on zero, zero, zero actual science. In fact, scientists were cautioning McGovern that let's not do this. We need a lot more work. And Govern, McGovern famously said, well, you know, you have time that I don't have as a senator and we've got to make a decision on this. And why they had to make a decision is beyond me. But anyway, that's when they basically uh, formalized this whole idea and started promoting it by the government that we had to eat a high carbohydrate, low fat diet. And we were in Grip, then that was the early stages of the uh, the whole lipid hypothesis of heart disease, which is still an hypothesis. A lot of people think it's a fact, but it's an hypothesis that if your cholesterol is elevated, that it's going to cause you to have heart disease. And it was known at the time that if people ate polyunsaturated fat, if they replaced saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat, the cholesterol went down. So they thought, okay, that's a good thing. So we need to substitute polyunsaturated fat for saturated fat. And this was all part of these nutritional guidelines based on virtually no science. And then they were codified in such a way into law that they had to have actual real science to overturn them. And it's difficult to get real science in nutrition because there's no money to be made. I mean, you can get all kinds of science if drug companies <laughs> are promoting it because there's yeah. money there that they could make if they get a drug approved. And so they're not shy about pouring tens and twenties of millions of dollars into drug studies, but who's going to pour a study into meat? Who's going to pour a study into potatoes? I mean, it can't, those can't be patented. And so you have very little funding for nutritional science as compared to pharmaceutical science. And so it's really difficult to overturn something, especially when it wasn't put in there based on hard science to begin with. But at that time, everything changed. And so the government itself started promoting low fat diets and the fats that they had people eat were polyunsaturated fats. They were told to avoid saturated fat, eat a lot of carbs, and they would do great. And this came about in the late seventies, early eighties. And now we're reaping that whirlwind because obesity after having been a, just kind of a slow, almost imperceptible incline, just really made an upshoot then. And now obesity is, I mean, it's just insane how many people are obese. And if you really want to get a picture of that, go back and watch a movie made in the 70s. And you see all these people that look like stick figures in the movie because that's what people look like back then. Go back and look at pictures of Woodstock. 
I mean, all these people are skinny. Now look at a picture of people on college campuses, which were the people that went to Woodstock, basically. Look at them now. They're obese. I mean, something has happened in this interim. And if you look at what's happened, you will see that we eat about uh, between 240 and 250 calories more per capita per day uh, than we did back then. You have to ask yourself, why are we eating more calories? Are carbs, do they taste better now? I mean, does toast taste better now than it did in 1974? Does an apple taste better now than it did in 1974? Why are we suddenly eating more carbohydrates? And so if you look at all the data, what you see is that most of this extra 240 calories is made of carbohydrates, which, as I say, kind of demands an answer to the question, why are we doing that all of a sudden? If you look at what's happened with protein intake, it hasn't changed much. It's about the same as it was then. If you look at at fat intake, even though they were badgering us to eat less fat, fat intake is about the same. It's gone up a tiny bit. I mean, some of that increase, the extra 250 calories, a little bit of that's made of protein and a little bit of it's made of fat increase, but the vast majority of it is made with a carbohydrate increase. But I mean, protein is pretty much protein, but if you look at fat and you look at the makeup of the fat intake between then and now, it's pretty stunning because what you see is that as that saturated fat has really gone on a decline, polyunsaturated fat, especially the linoleic acid and 18 carbon polyunsaturated fat has just skyrocketed. I mean, and that's the one big thing that's changed because even the 250 calories in carbohydrates, that's not a big percentage increase over the carbohydrates we were eating back then. But if you look at the change in polyunsaturated fat, it's mm-hmm. stunning. It's skyrocketed. Yeah. I mean, there's a good graph. Yeah. Stefan Guianet, who's been on the podcast, put it together mm-hmm. and put it in his book, but it's just, everything's kind of flat and there's this insane uptick with the linoleic acid. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. And so then, I, and, and plus you've got a big fall off in saturated fat because people are replacing and Let me back up for a minute. You know, People say there's a video out there somewhere that you can look up that if you put my name in Eads and put O'Reilly, you can see I was on the O'Reilly factor, Mm -hmm. you know, the Mm -hmm. Fox News show back in the day that was so popular. And I was on the O'Reilly factor. Oh, God, this was 20 years ago. I was talking about the, you know, the dietary guidelines and how bad they are. That was then. I mean, people are even way more obese now. But, you know, O'Reilly asked me the question that a lot of people ask, said, Doc, what's, you know, who cares? I never look at the nutritional guidelines. They don't guide my diet. And that's kind of a fallacy because they do. They guide it in a sense by what's available for you to eat. And they really guide it because they're about 50 some. This was back then. I don't know what it is now. It's probably 70 million. But 50 million people then, 52 million, I think, or 53 million people are fed by the government. And part of these nutritional guidelines is that anybody that gets fed by the government has to get a fed according to the guidelines. So that means people in the military, people in prisons, people are on commodity programs, school lunches, anything where the government feeds people, they have to follow the guidelines. You know, 50 some million people is a lot of people getting fed by this. And because the government feeds all these people, food manufacturers want to fall into line because they know people are going to be looking at labels. And so they don't want to have a lot of saturated fat. So they figure ways to switch saturated fat away and put vegetable oils in instead. And so, you know, what O'Reilly said, he's not making a conscious choice of what to eat, but he's making a choice based on what's available. And if all you've got is this crap available, that's what you're Mm -hmm. going to eat. And if you used to eat McDonald's fries, they used to be made with beef tallow and they were delicious. Now, if you eat McDonald's fries, they nah, people that have compared them think the beef tallow ones are better. And I'm sure they are. But now they're made mm-hmm. with vegetable oil and they had to put in all kinds of, you know, food technologists got in there and figured out all kinds of things that they could put in to make them taste the same, different flavorings to make them taste the same as the beef tallow. But it's a totally different fat. Uh, in the McDonald's French fries now. So, you know, O'Reilly may say, well, you know, I like McDonald's fries and I eat them. No, I don't care what the guidelines say. Well, because of the guidelines yeah. <laughs> and McDonald's trying to, you know, comply with that, you're getting a whole different Highly kind of oxidized fat. vegetable oils, especially in these fryers that have been heated high and reused. It's huge. Yeah. It's ve- yeah. That's huge. I mean, that could be one of the biggest yeah. things that went wrong is switching from beef tallow because people eat so many fries in America, switching from beef tallow to right. PUFAs. It's, right. it's huge. Right. Well, I, you know, so I, I kind of 
came up with this hypothesis in thinking about all this and looking at this. And I started saying, well, what, you know, what if uh, somehow this increased amount of food that we're eating, this extra 240 or 250 calories was somehow related to the fall off in saturated fat and the increase in polyunsaturated fat. Maybe that has something to do with it. And I tried to figure out a mechanism for that that was plausible, you know, and reading around, I, I came across this guy in, in the UK named Peter Dombromilski, who is a, a retired vet, but he's really a smart guy. And he'd kind of, a la Elon Musk, gone back to first principles and kind of retraced what happens molecularly when you eat fat and when you eat different kinds of fat. And he put together this theory that the minute I saw it, I said, holy crap, this is exactly what I've been looking for. This this explains it. Of course, you know, there was confirmation bias afoot because I was looking for something that, you know, that agreed with my hypothesis. But it does make a plausible case, and it's really highly technical and hard to go into just yeah. <laughs> without diagram. But basically, one of the ways that, uh, let's say, fat cells when they've got enough fat in them, the way they turn it away is that they produce insulin and insulin stops the fat from going into the fat cells and it kind of redistributes it and, and fat cells that are, that are full. Cause I'm, I'm sure not every fat cell fills up at exactly the same rate. So the ones that fill up first kind of produce this insulin and stops the fat from going in there. And so it redirects it to others until they're, they're kind of all full. And then when they're all full, the body probably ratchets up its energy expenditure to, you know, to get rid of it. But what's interesting is that that saturated fat, if you go back and look at at what happens to to fat in general, it gets mainly broken down inside the mitochondria. And in order to get into the mitochondria, well, it gets into the mitochondria. Once it's in the mitochondria, it um, goes through this process called beta oxidation. And there's a step left out on polyunsaturated fats that's not left out on saturated fat. And the step that's not left out on saturated fats makes saturated fats basically make the fat cell shut down the intake of fat, whereas the step that's left out on the polyunsaturated fat sort of enhances the uptake of fat. So this enhanced uptake of fat that makes perfect sense in view of what's happened since the late 70s, early 80s, that people have gotten hugely fatter for seemingly no reason. You know, if you're fat, if you've gained weight, you need to basically eat more to sustain that. So people, they kind of eat more because they're gaining weight. They don't necessarily gain weight because they're eating more. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. See what I mean? It's like uh, teenagers. I mean, teenagers eat a lot mm-hmm. because they're growing. And fat people eat a lot because they're growing, but not in a, a particularly good way. And this this fat gets pushed into the fat cells and ultimately the fat cells increase in size. And when they increase in size, then there's another process that makes them insulin resistant. So they don't decrease in size a lot more, but up until that point, they can really increase. And this whole theory makes perfect sense in that saturated fat would be protective and unsaturated fat would be uh, not protective. I mean, it would, it would enhance this whole weight gain process. And so I think that, you know, you still got the percentage of people who are overweight because they're carb sensitive, like they were back in the 1930s and 40s and 50s and 60s. And those people do really well on low carbohydrate diets of one form or another. And then you've got the people that are overweight, uh, whose obesity has been driven by this uh, increase in, in linoleic acid, polyunsaturated fat, and a fall off in saturated fat. And interestingly enough, those people do well Mm -hmm. on low carbohydrate diets. And the reason is because most of this polyunsaturated fat is found in processed foods and it's found in French fries and it's found in all these baked goods that you don't eat if you're on a low carb diet. So by going on a low carb diet, you actually get rid of the polyunsaturated fats and you bump up the saturated fat intake. So it, it worked well back in the days when people got overweight, even when they ate a lot of saturated fat and didn't really have this polyunsaturated fat in the in the food chain. And basically because they were carb sensitive, as all the old scientists used to say. And so a low carb diet worked well for those people back then. And that was kind of the mainstay in the treatment of it. And now you've got this whole other, assuming that this hypothesis is correct, you've got this whole other sort of molecular process going on that also gets short circuited if you go on a low mm-hmm. carb diet because you don't have the processed foods where you find all this polyunsaturated fat. 
Yeah. So in a nutshell, <laughs> it's really kind of complex, but it makes perfect sense when you think no, it through. No, it does. Every person I'm interviewing, every doctor I talk to lately has been on this seed oil, you know, the PUFAs. Like, this is so huge. Yeah. And I think it really might be it. Like, it's an elegant explanation yeah. for everything. It, I mean, yeah, it's the replacement of fats. Like, that's the big thing. And a lot of people can agree on yeah. that, I think. Yeah, change your end. You know, and I don't think anybody, uh, I mean, I think people are just kind of empirically saying they're bad, that seed oils are bad because, um, you know, they're just not, haven't been a part of our diet up until, say, 1980. Uh, so it's a new addition to the diet. And I think that they just empirically think it's bad because a lot of bad stuff has happened against them. But what I like about this other hypothesis is it actually provides a plausible mechanism. Oh, yeah. For and you're bad. talking about the reverse electron transport. And is that a little bit too complex mm -hmm. to get into? <laughs> Well, that's that's what ends up happening. I mean, the saturated fats basically where they enter the whole uh, chain that ends up making ATP, which is the uh, the energy currency that keeps us alive. We make about our own body weight in ATP every day. And the place where saturated fats enter that or the electrons from saturated fat enter that process ends up creating kind of a bottleneck. And instead of the electrons going into this chain, there it reverses them and sends them back out. And when they go back out, they basically end up stimulating the process that produces the insulin that makes the cell a little bit insulin resistant and diverts the food coming in away to other cells. And so reverse electron transport is our friend, but it's uh you know, it's not one of those things that's really mm. easy to explain. Yeah, that was good. And if you want to learn more, you can watch the presentation on this that I can link to. And <laughs> yeah. I also think a big problem is satiety. I'm kind of like focused on satiety because I think this all plays into each other when we're uh -huh. talking about processing of foods and even this, you know, insulin and the vegetable oils factor in. And actually, you did mention this satiety part. In, they did a test, a feeding study with kids and different carbs and meatballs and found some of this. And even, mm -hmm. I forget what, if it was, uh, when you said about the McDonald's fries and beef tallow about stearic acid, and they showed that it reduced hunger if you cook mm -hmm. things with beef tallow. Mm -hmm. But to kind of transition into your other presentation, which I really love, because it focuses on satiety is how this stuff works in cretins and the insulin and food quality is the name of the presentation. And it's, it's similar to a uh, Gabor Adosi presentation. He's been mm -hmm. on the podcast talking about this stuff as well, but I love that you, you covered a lot of the, the same stuff and maybe you could talk about how this works. Like people wonder why processed foods are bad. And I'm trying to, let people know because usually people will just think, oh, yeah, of course, you know, McDonald's is bad because it's McDonald's or, oh, processed food's bad because they, you know, put some preservative in the bread. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure that preservative isn't great, but the problem is the bread. The problem is the white flour ground down and how it interacts with your body, not just, right. you know, some little preservative that they threw in there. So, let, yeah, let's kind of go right. through it with what. GIP and what GLP-1 are and how this works in your, your gut. <laughs> okay. Well, the um, GIP and GLP-1 are um, what are called incretins, and these are little kind of hormones that get released from specific cells in your GI tract, and the GIP gets released up high in the tract, uh, closer to your mouth, and the GLP-1 gets released lower in the tract. And it's interesting because they have what is called an incretin effect. And what the incretin effect, which was discovered back in the 60s, is, is the difference in insulin response to a food consumed orally versus given IV. What these guys did back in the 60s, is that the, they gave people an oral glucose tolerance test and they, they tracked their sugars like you do on a, a glucose tolerance test. And you get the typical curve that, you know, you drink the glucose and it goes up and then it comes down as your insulin comes down and knocks it down. And then they, they mimic that by putting people on IVs and giving them IV sugar. And so they had the exact same glucose curve. And then they measured in both cases, the insulin response and the insulin response to the IV glucose, you know, wasn't all that high. It was, uh, relatively low. I mean, it did go up a little bit because, uh, you know, insulin helps get rid of the sugar, but it um, went 
absolutely nuts when they took it orally and they couldn't figure this out. And they said, what is going on? There's, there's something happening when you consume foods orally that runs the insulin way up. And as it turns out, there are these little cells that secrete in cretins and in cretins, GIP mainly, which is the one I'm really the most interested in, and GLP-1 I'm sort of interested in, but the, it's been hijacked by the pharmaceutical industry because they're trying to make drugs that make more of it or that act like it because it's been shown to uh, increase insulin without the increase in glucagon. GIP sends up both insulin and glucagon. So if you can just send up insulin, then you can you can control people's blood sugar who have diabetes. And so since so many have diabetes, that's a mother load for drug companies if they can come up with a new drug to increase your body's production and release of insulin. But anyway, what GIP is in the upper part of the the digestive tract, they're like little sentries that sit there and you may fool yourself and say, I'm not eating processed food, but you don't Mm -hmm. fool these cells because they know it and they send the signal to the pancreas, "Uh uh-oh, trouble's coming, dump some insulin. And so I believe, as I do, that the um, kind of your lifetime area under the insulin curve kind of tells how healthy you are and probably Mm -hmm. your longevity. And the lower that amount is, the better off you are uh, because insulin does a lot of bad things as well as good things. And so you want to have it high enough to do the things that it needs to do, but not high all the time doing all the bad things. And so you'd like to do anything you can to keep insulin levels down. And one of the things you can do to keep insulin levels down is to not eat processed foods and keep your GIP low. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in for one second? Because I think it's super important. And I think tons of people should agree on this. The degree that you keep your insulin down over the lifetime is the better you are. And I think This is kind of one of the unifying theories of nutrition. I like to study all diets and any good diet that works or any good lifestyle, you know, eating way of eating that works lowers insulin. Kind of what I'm saying is some diets that are more plant-based, people in the meat-based community are wondering why they work. And I believe it's wise because they also lower insulin. You're eating the whole foods and you're not having these constant glucose Mm -hmm. excursions and resulting insulin excursions. So it right. is this kind of unifying right. theory. It's like you want to have the least amount of insulin excursions over your lifetime. So whatever diet produces that and, you know, a great diet that does that is a low carb diet. Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at, uh, I mean, if you look at these centenarian studies, you know, there are a handful of them out there where people have evaluated people who've lived to be over a hundred and they, you know, they put them through the ringer and test everything known to man and they look for something that's uh, uh that's a commonality among them because i mean you've got centenarians who have smoked you've got centenarians who eat red meat all their life centenarians who've not eaten much meat you've got uh you know they've been in all kinds of different jobs from manual labor to white collar jobs and there they are all over a hundred and one of the things that you find in there a commonality among centenarians is they all have low mm-hmm. insulin levels they all have low fasting insulin levels, and they've got pretty low glucose levels, and they uh, have pretty low triglyceride levels for the most part. And you can get all those things from eating a low-carb diet. Now, does that mean if you eat a low-carb diet, you'll be a mm-hmm. centenarian? Who knows? We don't know, but we know that it can it can mimic uh, at least the effect that uh, uh, mimic sort of the blood picture that centenarians have. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's also ancestrally appropriate. I mean, there's many reasons why everything lines up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but these in Cretans, GIP in particular, is lurking there and waiting because if the food that comes down has been damaged, in other words, damaged by processing and not necessarily by having chemicals added to it, because a lot of people say, well, you put chemicals in there, preservatives, that's processed foods. I'm talking about foods that have been mechanically the lowest kind of the little grains of whatever they are have been broken down. You know, the starch granules have been broken down so that the, the starch inside is released. Whenever that happens, these incretins say, uh-oh, and they run your insulin level up. And the thing that runs insulin levels up the highest, because once people have gotten onto this effect, they've started saying, okay, what does it the most? Does protein do it? Well, protein doesn't really do it at all. Does fat do it? Fat does it minimally. 
The only reason that fat does it is because you're going to have insulin to store fat. So it stimulates a little bit of insulin response, but not much. Not like carbohydrates do, and not like refined carbohydrates do that, that have had the integrity of their units broken up in the processing process. But what really runs it up is fat Together. carbohydrate. Yeah, that gives you the highest in Cretan response of all. And what are processed foods? They're fat and carbohydrate. Usually, little lake acid and fructose, which are the two worst things that you can have. You know, it's interesting to see that. And people have done, um, you know, they've looked at eating a sandwich, for example. There's a study that I talk about in the presentation where people eat a sandwich and it's, you know, it's made of dried meat and bread and butter and it seems like something else I can't remember now, but. You know, when you eat the sandwich all together, you have a certain response. And when you eat this stuff separate, you have widely varying responses. And there have been some interesting studies in in Japan and looking at, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, when you eat. If you're going to break the foods down and eat them separately, you want to eat yeah, the meat first and then the vegetables and then dessert, a high-carb dessert. You want to eat the dessert first. Do you want to put them all together in a slurry and eat them all at once, which no one would do? But, you know, what's going to have your insulin levels the lowest? And it turns out that your insulin levels go up the least if you eat the, the dessert last, which interestingly is just mm-hmm. how we do it. And so if you eat the higher protein and fat foods first and followed by the vegetables and then the dessert at last, that gives you the lowest insulin response of all if you're going to eat all those foods. The lowest insulin response would be to eat the meat. (laughs) I love that. And there's a bunch of other studies that you talked about. Just the food combination stuff is super interesting, though, about the sandwich. And I think there's one more about the different food combinations and not to do with the order, but just the yeah. showing that the increase in response, that the yeah. high insulin response was due to mixing. So there's so many reasons why eating high fat and high carb together are bad. Some people talk about the Randall cycle. Some people talk about the hyper palatability. Or you could talk about this, mm-hmm. this response. It's really all of them. Right. It's like not only is it delicious and you can eat more yeah. of it, but it's also doing all these things in your body. It's like it's two energy sources. Your body's yeah. like, what the hell's going on? You're giving me two energy sources. Yeah. And like, you know, the, the point I made in that one was shown that fat and carbohydrate went so high when consumed together. If you think about it, you know, you've got high fat foods and you've got high carb foods. Where in nature do you find a food that's high in both of them? I mean, you can get sugar that's sweet. I mean, you can get sugar that's sweet. <laughs> you can get you know, ripe peaches that are sweet. You can get strawberries that are sweet. You can get, you know, berries that are sweet. But they don't have any fat in them to speak of. I mean, they get a little bit, but a tiny bit. You can get meat, uh, which has got a lot of fat, but it doesn't have any carbs. You can have avocados that have a lot of fat and a minimal amount of carbs. But you never get find anything in nature that's high in both carbs and fat. Yeah. And well, really, the only thing is breast milk for that's specifically designed to make a baby grow and gain weight. And I love just pointing out that one caveat because <laughs> it's a very yeah, specific yeah. part of you know a young yeah. human's life, and it's not. Yeah, right. And that's what it's designed to is to foment growth. Yeah, and then and also people point out that the only time that you can in nature that the foods are high carb and high fat foods are available that humans would combine and eat at the same time is right before winter. And, and it's also the time to fatten people up so that they can survive winter. Yeah. And that's when, you know, fruit is out and fruits high in fructose and fructose is a, is a really fattening carb. I mean, you know, it all fits in the picture. Exactly. And there's also this, the mice study, it was really interesting when they ground up the food they have, they gave the different, you know, low carb, Mm -hmm. high carb, you know, standard chow Mm -hmm. and they had all different Mm -hmm. weight gains, but when they ground them up, they were all the same. Right. And, you know, and that's the thing that you, you know, that you've got to look at. And I'm glad that those guys went the extra mile in that study because, uh, you know, when you're talking about, they gave them, you know, chow and they had, you know, very little weight gain. And chow is, uh, you know, carbohydrate mainly and uh, a little bit of fat and protein in it. You just your standard rodent chow. This rodent study showed that if you fed rodents chow in a Western diet and a high fat diet, that you had three different weight gain curves, the lowest being with the rat chow, which is a lot of carbohydrate and a little bit of fat and a little bit of protein. 
then if you give them a high fat diet, they really gain a lot of weight. And if you give them a Western diet, they're sort of intermediate, but more toward the high fat end. And people have used studies like this over and over again to make the case that you don't gain much weight on carbohydrates and you gain more weight or at least rodents do on higher fat diets. So the researchers that did, did this study is that they confirmed this fairly common finding and then they took all these foods and they minced them up. They ground them up so that the the chow was ground up uh, in the same way that the fat was and the same way that the protein was. And so it was all just a powder and they gave it to them, uh, to the rodents. And when that happened, you know, the rats all gained the same amount of weight, um, irrespective of which diet that they used. So it tells you that having a, a diet with the, uh, you know, all the, the components intact, you're going to gain less weight and produce less insulin than if you have them um, processed, and which I thought was a pretty fascinating study. It's super important. And what fats are they using in these studies too, right? Are they using the uh, polyunsaturated? Yeah. Usually always a crummy fat. Yeah. And, you know, a friend of mine calls it crap in a bag. <laughs> yeah. That they use to feed these animals in these studies. So it's hard a lot of times to even draw meaningful results from the data because they eat this crud that most people wouldn't eat. You don't have a slurry of, you know, mainly all linoleic acid. And that's a lot of times what they do in these studies, putting these various chows together. All right. So this is so awesome. So I noticed at the end of your presentation, you had some slides that didn't make it in and you made some points that you shouldn't graze and you, you know, shouldn't snack all day and that you should eat fewer, larger meals. So both of these I'm super into. Do you remember what studies or data you were going to present on if you had these? Uh, gosh, no, presentation a couple of years ago. Um, no, I don't exactly remember. I mean, you know, there are multiple uh, studies that show that. I mean, you know, people seem to think that you should just eat all the time. And I don't think that's true because you might as well just be hooked up to a, a bag of you know glucose draining into your blood. I think your liver and other organs need a chance to rest. And that's why alternate day fasting works so well, because, you know, in rodent studies, for example, it shows that if you feed rats every other day, I mean, if you have genetically similar rats, and you divide them into two groups and you let one of them eat all at once. And you measure how much it eats and then you let the other ones just eat every other day. Uh, the day that they eat, they eat twice as much as they would normally. And so they end up consuming the same amount of calories or the same type of food. And yet they gain less weight. They uh, have better health. They live about 30% longer. They have a big increase in BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which increases their cognition. They can work mazes better. BDNF is what makes your brain have good plasticity and gives it the ability to learn. And so uh, just doing nothing with calories, but just having them every other day makes a huge difference. So if you work backwards on that, it tells you you don't want to eat all the time. You're better off, you know, throwing your food into bigger meals and having fewer of them because it gives you a chance to, you know, your metabolism to rest. And back when I was wearing a continuous glucose monitor so I could monitor my own blood glucose on an ongoing basis, it's pretty amazing because I don't eat that often. I eat a couple of times a day and, and you know, it would just be a straight line all day long and then a little blip when I ate because I always eat low carb. And, um, and so I think that if you eat all day, you just have those blips all day long. And if your sugar's up, your insulin's going to be up. And as I said, the, the lower you can keep the area under your insulin curve over your lifetime, the better off you're going to be. It's so important. And there's so many other good benefits of eating fewer, larger meals. I mean, the more times you eat, the more opportunity there is to eat too much, kind of too. And then there's this whole autophagy thing. You know, people know now that how, why intermittent fasting is so popular is when you're not eating, your body gets to rest and repair. There's a ton of different reasons why, even just carb frequency too. I like Ted Naiman, Dr. Ted Naiman likes to talk about, you can maybe eat carbs, but it's about the frequency. Maybe if you only eat once a day, you can have some carbs and it's, it's not that big a deal, but most people are eating like six times a day. Yeah, there was another interesting thing that I discovered when I did my continuous glucose monitor uh, is that uh, what carbs affected me and what didn't. And I think it's an individual thing. 
And I would recommend that everybody get these things. You know, you can get them, if you get a doctor's prescription, a lot of times your insurance will pay for them. But even if it doesn't, it costs you about a hundred bucks to get a month's worth of them. Now, each little sensor lasts for two weeks and you just gives you instructions and you stick it onto the back of your arm and it measures your glucose on an ongoing basis. And you can take a shower and it's like, it's not even there. It didn't slow me down at all. And then you take your smartphone and you just kind of, pull the app up and run it over that. And it gives you not just the glucose at that minute, but it gives you glucose for about the previous six or seven hours, because there's a little chip in the, in the sensor that you wear on the back of your arm that records all that uh, on an ongoing basis. Then it dumps it in your phone when you click on it. So you can kind of keep a 24 hour tabulation of your glucose levels. And I discovered that because in following a low carb diet, I just, I don't eat many things that have carbs in them period. Um, so I decided the first two weeks of this, that it was going to, you know, I was going to do science. And so I indulged myself in all these different carb things. And what I found out was really pretty interesting is that bread didn't affect my glucose very much, which surprised me because I mm. figured it would, and I don't eat bread as a consequence. And, but when I ate it, it didn't really seem to affect it. Potatoes didn't affect it. And I can have I'm not, now granted, I didn't have a lot of potato, but we like these little bitty, uh, you know, purple and white mm. red potatoes that you can get in these bags. And so I'll have a steak and maybe four of those cut in half with some butter on them and some little cherry tomatoes or something for dinner. And my glucose doesn't budge. I mean, mm. it does not budge. You couldn't even tell I had eaten. It's just a flat line with those potatoes. And so I did that. And then one night I said, okay, let's see what happens if I add ice cream. And I added ice cream after the meal and didn't do anything, a straight flat line. And then I thought, God, that's weird. So the next day after I hadn't eaten for five or six hours, I decided to have a bowl of ice cream to see what happened. Same thing, nothing. (laughs) You couldn't tell that I'd even eaten anything. Wow. Yeah. And then I ate sushi. God, it skyrocketed. I mean, absolutely skyrocketed. And, but then came back down fairly quickly. But that was the highest blood sugar I had during the whole time. It went up to almost 150 eating uh, sushi with the sushi wow. rice. And then I tried eating something that everybody thinks is really great. I had these steel cut oats, you know, the kinds you get mm-hmm. in the can that are steel cut oats. And I had them with nothing. Another good thing about low carb dieting, because if you low carb diet all the time, you end up sensitizing your sweet receptors. And so stuff that normally wouldn't taste sweet to you, taste sweet to you. Like if you eat green beans, they really taste sweet. Mm -hmm. If you're eating a high carb diet, they don't particularly taste sweet. And it's the same thing with oatmeal. I could eat it with nothing because it tasted sweet. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when I did that, my blood sugar not only went up, it stayed up. It stayed up for about three hours. And I was stunned because I'd always thought if ever I wanted to indulge in carbs, I'd always eat some steel cut oats because I thought those have minimal effect. And they ended up having, in terms of area under the curve, the largest effect of anything I tried. That's so crazy. I, yeah, I think that's it's super important for people to test. And, you know, I am actually need to plug my company again because with Sapien, we're doing this. We're... We've been building this tech forever and I keep talking about it and it never comes out because technology takes forever. We have an app coming out that will, and we have a partnership with a CGM company and we're going to be sending these out and we can have a P- doctors in all 50 states so you can get a prescription for it and you can get these CGMs and test all these things and really see what's going on with you and like stay on track and so much information can be uh, gleaned from these things. So. It's incredible because other people have different responses. So what may run my glucose up might not run yours up. But as I've I've told this story to so many people and every one of them without fail has discovered the same thing about steel cut oats that it runs their sugar up and keeps it there for about three hours. The other interesting thing I found out about using the continuous glucose monitor was after I got through my first two weeks of testing, actually just tested for about a week, maybe a week and a half. And once I got through the, uh, the testing process, then my goal became, and it it wasn't a goal I set out to achieve. And I said, I'm going to do this. I just did it. I didn't want my glucose to go up. So I was really careful about what I ate. (laughs) So it did really kept me on the straight and narrow because I wanted to have this continuous day after day after day after day of just a level blood sugar. Yeah. Well, it's like gamification is the term yeah. for these days, right? You, yeah, yeah. It's like a game. It's fun. Yeah. 
And so I thought, yeah, this is kind of cool. It, it really keeps you on the straight and narrow. Yeah. You no, know, if I want to indulge in carbs, I'll eat a little bit of bread because I know that that doesn't do anything to me. Now, and when I did that, I didn't eat, you know, it wasn't like I sat down and ate a loaf of Wonder Bread. I had a, uh, you know, a little, just one of these kind of little pieces of Italian bread. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, you know, the next thing I want to try to test with it, I still have one that I haven't put on yet. It's got another two weeks worth. I want to try some, you know, weigh some just regular white bread and, and some sourdough bread because I've heard from a lot of people that whose sugar does go up on regular bread that it doesn't go up on sourdough bread. And I've heard that from a lot of diabetics and I always poo-pooed it and thought, you know, that's BS. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's still got carbs in there. Why is your blood sugar not going up with sourdough bread? And I thought, you know, they're just telling me that because – they want to eat it. Mm-hmm. And so I'd kind of like to test that. I'd forgotten all about that when I was doing my own testing. And then I ran into somebody that mentioned that. I thought, God, I wish I'd have done that when I was doing that. But I, mm. it didn't occur to me. Yeah, try that. Because I'm curious, too, because I, Dr. Bill Schindler's really into the sort of Weston Price traditional preparations of foods. And he, he's really into baking bread with his family. And he does this overnight fermented sourdough. So he's all about doing it. And he thinks that that, and I agree, that has a lot to do with it, is doing it the traditional way and the fermenting or, you know, the sprouting, soaking, all these things change. Yeah, and you got to be careful in sourdough bread because I went out and got some. And, you know, I mean, I got it just recently, but it's it's kind of hard to find, particularly hard to find now in these days of COVID and social distancing and all that, uh, because the store, I used to see it all the time, but I never bought it. And our local store now went to get some and they didn't have it. So I had to go somewhere else. And, and I finally found one. And I'm not sure that that's even a, a great one. But what you have to look for is you've got to make sure that it has sourdough starter mm. in the ingredients, because a lot of breads like with everything, they're called that, but they're not. They've mm-hmm. got some kind of sourdough flavoring in them. That's a good point. Yeah, they can make the fake, like quick process, factory mm-hmm. process stuff, but it needs to take time to yeah. do the actual fermentation. Right. And so you've got to have that. And so uh, I only found one that did, which was the one I bought, but mm-hmm. uh, eaten some of it, but I haven't had my monitor on, so I don't know what it is mm-hmm. or what it did to me. Um, but anyway, you got to be careful to make sure you get actual sourdough bread and not something just called sourdough bread. Yeah, that's a good point. We should wrap it up here. So you wrote the book Protein Power. I have it sitting right next to me. I just looked at it. It was 1996. So you've Mm -hmm. been at this a while. I love it too because the sapien diet, like the stuff that I talk about, focus on protein, embrace fat, minimize carbs. That's the key to me. Some people doing like keto diets, they're like chugging fat nonstop. And it's just, I think protein is so beneficial. So if you want to give like a quick overview of protein power, and then I believe you're writing a new book. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got, I think, 14 of them out there and all, but uh, we're doing an update on protein power. Calling it, We're going to call it protein power 2.0. 2.0 because it's about 20 years. We started this a couple of years ago, back in 2016. And so it was going to be a 20 year update uh, on on protein, but actually longer ago than that because now protein, let's see. Well, this one says 96 on it. Yeah, 2016. No, that's when it was. It came yeah. out in 90. So 2016 was a 20 year update. And then, you know, just like with uh, software, a 2.0 update <laughs> takes a while. Uh, you know, it's like a 2.4. <laughs> yeah. But call it protein power 2.0 and um, what we were going to do is just kind of update protein power and we went back and read protein power and there's really not anything in there there was some of the stuff that was speculative and not really anything in there that was wrong but the problem was with protein power when we were out promoting that is that you know on the book tour from hell that never ended Mm -hmm. uh, you know one of the questions we were always asked and then I'd written another book a uh, similar book, a predecessor to that in 1989. And I was constantly asked this question, if everything you say is true, and this is this miraculous, where are all the studies? There really weren't a lot of studies then because people weren't looking at that. Mm-hmm. They had just, everybody had, on Moss had decided that, uh, you know, the low fat, high carb diet was the way to go. So nobody was comparing it. And, and you could find studies where people tried to do the low carb diet as a bad diet and ended up being surprised because they got better results on it. Uh, but there just really weren't a lot of studies to be found. And now there are tons of studies out there. Mm-hmm. And 
virtually all of them show the superiority of the low carb diet. Yeah. And the weight loss and improvement of cardiovascular risk factors, improvement of blood sugar and improvement of blood pressure. I mean, across the board, it's shown over and over and over and over again to be a vastly superior diet. So now we want to take some of that information and then expand things because back then there were a thousand low fat diets, but only one low carb diet. And it was just, you know, kind of called the low carb diet or the Atkins diet. And now, you know, you've got the carnivore diet, you've got the uh, ketogenic diet, you've got just your standard low carb diet, you've got, you know, the, the main, <laughs> yeah, million variations in the low carb diet. So we want to talk about some of those things and, and some of the research that's come to light since then, you know, stuff about in Cretans, uh, uh, just a lot of different information that wasn't available back then that I think would be a much more compelling book now. And, you know, and the results of all these studies, there have been, I don't know, 65, I think, studies comparing low-carb to low-fat diets. And, you know, for both diabetics and people who are just overweight and, and the low-carb diet has just crunched it uh, across the board. So we want to bring about that and some of these mechanisms like the, you know, the mechanism of the reverse electron transport, if we can figure out how to describe it. In a simple way, yeah. <laughs> to people who are, are, you know, don't have a scientific education. And so anyway, that's what we're working with on that. That's great. I can't wait for it. It's going to be just an update and now it's going to be an entirely Absolutely. new book. Well, going to read it. Tell, send it my way. I'd love to get an early copy and whatever I can do to promote it. Yeah, we'll put you on the list and we'll, uh, you know, we can do this again then. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm sure people are going to love this and have questions and we can do another one. And since I've been promoting my stuff the whole time, I'll promote your sous vide machine because we <laughs> talked a lot about sous vide in Denver. I'm a big fan of doing that for all my steaks. What is it called again? Sous vide Supreme. Dot com. Well, the website is sous vide supreme.com. Yeah. So it's a U S V I D E supreme, all one word.com. And it's the whole thing. Yeah. It's like, I have these like cheapy one that isn't very good, mm -hmm. but I need to get like the real deal from you. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, you know, I mean, sous vide cooking is interesting because if you, uh, once you get into it, you use it for everything. And uh, it's big virtue is that you can do everything the same every time. You know, sometimes when you got to cook a steak on the grill, you do it and it's just is absolutely fabulous. And then the next time you do it, it's maybe not that good. Or maybe it's not quite cooked the way you like it. And, and, you know, you got a lot of variability and with sous vide cooking, you get, you completely get rid of that and you get rid of the time variable because if you're cooking a steak uh, on a grill, I mean, it's a timing process and you've got to get it off at just the right time. And you really can't control a lot of times how hot the grill is. And so you don't know exactly what the good time is to get it off. And with sous vide cooking, the same every time. And it takes a little fooling around with to get it to figure out what temperature you'd like it mm -hmm. cooked at. But once you get that figured out, then every steak is going to be perfect. And people who use these things, I mean, get into sous vide cooking like we do. I mean, we use it for everything. We don't almost never use our oven unless it's just a to, uh, you know, char something on the top. I mean, we never use it for anything. We use the sous vide unit all the time. And if you do that, you need to get, you need to get one of ours. You need to get a standalone unit that's a, an appliance that sits on your counter because all these other things, like the one you have, they're kind of like science projects. Mm -hmm. You know, you got water strung and they throw off a lot of heat and you got to be careful or the water evaporates and burns out your pumps. You got to, because uh, sometimes sous vide cooking goes overnight, so people have to set alarms to get up in the night, or they have to put ping pong balls in the water, or cover the top with aluminum foil, and you know all kinds of things they have to do. And these, uh, you know, our units have no moving parts. These stick units, these immersion circulators, like you have, have a, a bunch of moving parts in there, and so those break. And if uh, you know people have this experience all the time, if you read about it on Facebook where they use it, they love it. And they go to take it out and they got a big deal coming up and they want to be have this perfect sous vide food and they put it in, they turn it on and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're prone to do that. And, you know, you've got to clean them. I mean, there's just a ton of problems with them. They're kind of a toy. 
Mm-hmm. And if you want to see if you like sous vide cooking, get one and try it because they're inexpensive. But if you really want to get into it, you need to get a self-contained unit that's looks beautiful out on your counter and you know ours you can turn on from work and it's got an app and it's got all that stuff and so it's really the only one out there like that Mm -hmm. all all the rest of these immersion things that make noise you know people their dogs take off when they turn them on because it has a sound that dogs can hear that drives crazy anyway i love that you're passionate about it because we talked about i'm just really into it as well i need to get a better one and that's great. Yeah, and I also was talking about coming up and filming with you in Santa Barbara because it's uh, just, you know, 90 minute drive. And, you know, hopefully we're allowed to see one another <laughs> sometime yeah. soon. And maybe we can get you in the film yeah, and talk so, about some of this stuff. Because so. yeah. we're, you know, we're here half time and in Texas half time. So we can do it when we're here. It'd be a long drive to go to Texas. <laughs> well, I love Texas. So. So do we. All right. Well, Thank you so much, and uh, let's talk again soon. Okay, how about that one? Go to saping.org, sign up for the newsletter, check out what we're doing there. Go to nosetail.org and get all that great meat. Foodlies.org to support the film, and share it with a friend. Start back at episode one, and give it a review on the podcast app or iTunes. It really helps. Thanks so much, and see you next week.